You're absolutely in a bubble. You're essentially quarantined from everyone, really, just so it's a professional sporting environment and to keep those standards as high as possible. You know, as you get older, you sort of realise how different your life is and how different your work is to, to most workplaces. When you're playing in a high-level sport, you've got a lot of things that are taken care of for you. So I, I didn't have to worry about paying for my accommodation. You know, you get a good salary, all those sorts of things. Um, and then you come home and that's all taken away from you. But the spending and so on is still there. When you spend so much of your life devoted to one particular thing, and it really is the focus of everything you do in your life, and then that's gone all of a sudden. Um, it's a big hole to fill. There's so many transferable skills. You don't last in a system as cutthroat as the AFL for nearly 15 years if you don't have the ability to obviously work hard, be disciplined, be part of a team, execute skills, culturally lead the right way. So, yeah, I've got no doubt that that'll transfer. to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Onside, I'm Tim Gable. What a feast of sport we've had over the past month. It was a fitting end to the season in the AFLW and the WBBL competitions. In the AFLW, the Brisbane Lions won a second premiership after an impressive come-from-behind victory over North Melbourne. The Strikers won back-to-back WBBL championships after defeating the Brisbane Heat by three runs in a pulsating final for the ages at the Adelaide Oval. And we have the BBL kicking off and the basketball season in full swing and the Matildas are building towards the final Olympic qualifier against Uzbekistan in February. And who can forget the Australian men's cricket team winning the World Cup for a sixth time? The superb victory means Australia extends their record as the most successful side in 50 over a side World Cup history and now sits four titles clear of the rest of the pack. In other news, our Cyber Safety and Security in Sport course has taken up the top gong at this year's LearnX Awards for the categories of Best E-Learning Project and Best E-Learning Design. The LearnX Awards recognise innovation and best practice in learning design around the world. We've also just released a Safeguarding Children and Young People in Sport induction course with new recruitment and screening modules. You can check it out at elearning.sportintegrity.gov.au. And while last month Sport Integrity Australia welcomed the appointment of 11 members to our advisory council, including the reappointment of prominent lawyer and sports administrator Sarah Kenny as the chair. The advisory council provides strategic advice to Sport Integrity Australia's CEO and advice to the Minister for Sport relating to the operations of Sport Integrity Australia. In this week's program, we explore life after sport and how hard it is for athletes to find their niche. We talk to AFL forward Josh Bruce, who retired because of injury near the end of the AFL season. Three-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer Petraea Thomas and Ben Hardy, an Olympian and former captain of the Australian national volleyball team. First up, though, we've been joined by Josh Bruce. Now, Josh played 163 AFL matches across 13 years in the AFL, representing the Western Bulldogs in Kilda and Greater Western Sydney. And Josh made his AFL debut in Round 5, 2012. Well, Josh, um, obviously retiring from the AFL, 31 years of age, 163 games in the AFL. What is life like on the other side after announcing your retirement from the AFL. Is it hard at times to come to terms with, with what is next? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, though. I, uh, you know, I was obviously taken out of my hands a little bit with my second ACL and then subsequent retirement after that. Um, and then sort of immediately we realised that we weren't going to live in Melbourne uh, for the long term. So... We thought it'd be best to be surrounded by family and whatnot for the, the short period. So we essentially tried to get our house ready for sale, move the kids out of the house, get them to Canberra, go through a whole auction campaign. Uh, so I haven't really had time to stop and think too much and uh, currently on the job hunt. So Yes. How hard is it um, to get your mind around, you know, preparing for, for the next stage in your life? Because you're in a bit of a bubble, aren't you, when you're playing professional football? Well, yeah, you're absolutely in a bubble. You, um, you're 
essentially quarantined from everyone really just so it's a professional sporting environment environment and to keep those standards as high as possible um you know it's just interesting the way that it's uh you know as you get older you sort of realize how different your life is and um how different your work is to to most workplaces so um yeah i mean it's something that i've uh i've certainly tried to um dip the toe in over the last few years uh doing work experience here and there and um yeah i mean it's something that i feel like i'll be it's definitely something that i'll miss but um yeah i was i was ready for it to be to finish especially after the, yeah. the second injury I would imagine, though, as a footballer, very hard to think about anything else but football. Hard to commit to, you know, the next stage in life, isn't it, when you're playing football? Well, it is. And, I mean, you come into the system and, uh, you know, people talk to you and they say, football's not going to last forever and make sure you have a plan for afterwards and all these things, which is obviously super important, but at the same time you want to make a fist of your career. So it's kind of, you know, I've got to give everything to football to succeed at the same time as... Well, let's think about it. if it doesn't succeed. You know, so it's kind of like a catch-22. It's, you know, sometimes you think, oh, if it doesn't work out, then I'll do this. But sometimes you just got to back yourself in and say it will work out. And it did for a long period of time. And, you know, I finished with a carpentry apprenticeship and a business uh, course and, you know, a bunch of stuff. So, um, yeah, it should be fine. Do you think enough is done, though, to prepare professional sports people for life after they finish playing sport? Uh, I think they've come on leaps and bounds in the last five or ten years or so. Um, but I guess it's just one of those things that you you have to go through to understand. Um, and it's something that I'm in the middle of right now. I mean, you can always you – know, I think I've said this before, but it's funny when you start your career and you see old guys retiring and they go, oh, it all went so fast and blah, 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 blah. Um, and you just sit there and go, no, nah, that'll never be me, you know. I'm, yeah. not, I'm never going to retire. Type thing. <laughs> Next thing you know, ten years later, thirteen yeah. years later, it's it does go quick. Yeah, uh, because you do read about and, and you see former professional sports people falling into a bit of a black hole because they don't have that adrenaline rush, they don't have that system in place, that program in place that has guided them um, from a very early age into their thirties, and suddenly they're left without those support mechanisms and. And um, as I say, mental health becomes a, a real issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I am, you know, I've got very high emotional intelligence and self-awareness and I know that I would potentially have risk factors for some of those issues. So uh, we immediately made the assessment that we needed to be surrounded by family um, and support networks first and foremost um, because we've got two young children and no family in Melbourne whatsoever. Um, so, you know, just some clear risk factors there and... I'm having the support of both my wife Pip's family and my family in Canberra is, um, yeah, and it, it's 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 a huge, uh, it's a huge chance, and I've seen it happen over and over and over again with ex teammates. Um, you know, they they don't have that rush, they don't have the people screaming their name, they don't have the, you know, there's all sorts of things about professional sport which make you feel good about yourself, your dopamine spikes and your serotonin and. You're exercising every day and you're forced to be there. You have to be there on a certain time and um, we now that regimented structure and in your life with all the other bonuses on top in terms of the way it makes you feel, um, people can find it really challenging. Yeah. How do, you, how do you cope with it? Do you make yourself busy? Um, is that the, and you mentioned there uh, surrounding yourself with family, but how do you, how do you cope with it? Um, I make myself busy, yes. Uh, I force myself to exercise, even though I don't really feel like it right now because uh, that's crucial for someone who's been addicted to exercise for such a long period yeah. of time. Um, I'm also just trying to set some little goals in terms of um, just so I've got a purpose for my exercise. So I'm going to start doing some, you know, little triathlons or aqua bikes, get my knee right. I'm going to play footy next year with my brother, um, which is something that I'm passionate about. Is coming back and playing with him at Eastlake. Um you know, and coaching them as well, so doing a bit of coaching. So I don't know how many games I'll get in with my knee, but, yeah, um, yeah just little things like that to just give you a bit of purpose with what you're doing instead of just sort of floating around. And I guess finding that next adrenaline rush is is going to be interesting for you and whether or not there is that, that adrenaline rush out there for you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who knows? We'll see what happens. Hopefully yeah. I can get it playing AFL camera, but if not, I'll have to... 
yep. go to Indonesia and get barreled or something. <laughs> Um, just on your career, a uh, fantastic career with uh, GWS, St Gilda and the Western Bulldogs. What was the highlight for you? That 10-goal that effort against North Melbourne? That was a good day. That was a very good day, um, you know, pretty clearly. But uh, there, was a couple of, there was a couple of days at the Saints where I sort of had breakout games, which mm. were, were pretty cool in 2015. I think I kicked six or seven against the Gold Coast and then another five or six two weeks later and just sort of that period where it's like oh actually you know, I'm a bona fide AFL player now this feels pretty good um, and then sort of at the Bulldogs I felt like we had some really really good team wins in 2021 we had a couple of massive wins on the road um, put Adelaide over there and I think we won 10 or 11 of our first games yeah. in a row so just no yeah, that was a pretty special time certainly felt like I was at the peak of my powers. I got really fit. I was playing good footy. I was, you know, nearly winning the Coleman team made a grand final. I was like, this is, this is it. This is the year. <laughs> <laughs> and then did my knee, so. Yeah. In- injuries can be cruel and that, that's part, I guess, of the mental health battle that a lot of athletes have because often their careers end prematurely, but uh, while they're rehabilitating, just I, I guess making sure that they remain focused and, and don't fall into that hole. Yeah, I mean, it's really challenging. When I first did my first knee, you know, I've had mental health issues growing up um, just based around some family stuff. And then, um, yeah, when I, you know, and then I've had, you know, belief issues and struggle issues and imposter syndrome, you know, issues, which everyone sort of does mm. um, coming into the system and then sort of felt like I belonged for a while and then, you know, it's just constant ebbs and flows. And, yeah, when I did my knee, obviously um, what I alluded to before in terms of, you know, that was the year for me. I just felt like it was just such a waste of time, like sacrificing so much. And then I was yeah. stuck in lockdown watching them play finals and stuff and then came back the next year and sort of just didn't really come back um, to where I thought I was going to be in terms of my body. It just didn't um, – it was never the same, really. My left knee is not – it's still not quite the same. So – um, and then, yeah, this year I sort of rebuilt myself and my confidence again. Um, I decided to go and play in defence to get a game because I knew they got Rory Lobb in. And I broke my sternum and four ribs in round five, which hurt a lot. <laughs> 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 uh, I lost a lot of confidence then um, and went through a really tough patch this year, like a really tough patch. I was playing twos and I was just couldn't even bother getting out of bed I couldn't um for the first time in my life to, didn't want to go to training I was mm. just I was over it and then enjoyed some of my footy in the twos the twos, the twos started humming along we we're winning we won five or six in a row and I was like I'll just happy, happily play twos for the year I don't care you know hopefully win a flag with the twos and uh got the call up I was answered the call and did my other knee so <laughs> I was like <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, I'm so happy this. I'm so sick of sacrificing. Yeah. And my body's just, yeah, it's had enough. I've just flogged yeah. it. So, Just on that imposter syndrome uh, that you were talking about there, a lot of people would find that hard to imagine given they see you on the stage and they think, you know, he's made it. Yet in your mind at times you think, gee, um, am I worthy of being here at times? But, you know, that, that must be a hard thing to deal with at times, I guess, when you're on the field and, and people are sort of um, adulating you, yet at the same time you have those self-doubts. Ah, oh, constantly. Through my whole childhood, my whole career, it's constantly just like, you know, I'm not good enough. People don't think I'm good enough. I'm going to prove them wrong. Mm. But at the same time, my brain's saying, when are they, when's everyone going to realise that you're a fraud? When's mm. everyone going to realise you actually just, you've faked it the whole time, you know? Mm. It's just the craziest thing. Your brains are just wild how... Yeah. You know, you look at someone who you'd think would be supremely confident, but they've got the same issues that you've had or the same thought processes, just the way our brains are wired. So, yeah, it's yeah. pretty fascinating stuff for sure. And you can't afford to show that weakness, can you? You know, you, you've got to be out there looking as though you're supremely confident. Yeah, I think so. And I th- But I think, you know, within the four walls of your footy club and around your family, I think that vulnerability is um, crucial to, to any sort of growth and, um, and to realising that, you know, whether or not I played a good game of footy doesn't make me a better mm. person or a worse person. You know, yeah. I'm still worthy of, you know, everything. So yeah, mm. as a footballer, I mean, you you do have certain skills that can be 
applicable elsewhere. Um, you know, obviously, you know, well known. Um, you've shown that you you can be disciplined um, within a, a, a structure. Um, there are plenty of things, I guess, that can be transferred into into the general life from from being a professional sports person. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many transferable skills. Um, you know, you don't last in a system as cutthroat as the AFL for nearly 15 years if you don't have uh, the ability to obviously work hard, be disciplined. Um, be part of a team too. Be part of a team, execute skills, you know. Mm. Um, culturally, you know, fit in, lead mm. the right way. So, yeah, there's – and at three organisations as well. So, um, yeah, I've got no doubt that that will transfer – yeah, uh, and you mentioned a moment ago that you focus now on possibly getting back playing with your brother Aaron, and um, you know that's th- that'd be fantastic for you, wouldn't it? Just to get out there and, and play with him. Yeah, it would be. Uh, you know, he's been my best friend and my best mate for forever and a day, um, and we've both been in teams that have been historically not that good in terms of team success. You know, he's he's like haven't won one since two thousand and one, and. Um, I played in one final in my career and lost it against my old team. So, um, you know, we'd call each other at the end of the year and we'd both kicked a bunch of goals mm. and the teams <laughs> weren't in teams that sort of um, had any success meaningful. So, yeah, it's pretty. It's more than half the reason of why I moved back to camera. So I'm looking forward to running mm. around. And, of course, another skill is that you, you have the ability to relate to fellow sports people you know, understand what they're going through in a bit to achieve success. I think that would be a, yeah, an absolute gift uh, in terms of uh, a workplace. Yeah, it is. And I love I love connecting with, um, you know, sports people, ex-sports people, because there's just sort of things that uh, you go through that um, most people don't understand or realise, mm. you know, how difficult certain little aspects are. And it might even just be something small. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's certainly certainly uh, profound when you can have a meaningful conversation with with an ex athlete or a, an ex um, sports person. So, good luck with the future, uh, Josh. Great to have a chat, and obviously the you know a few goals yet to be kicked in life. And um, thanks very much for joining us on Onside. Thanks for having me. Cheers. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Welcome back to Onside. Our next guests are Olympians Patria Thomas and Ben Hardy. Patria made her international swimming debut at the age of 17 and went on to amass three Olympic and three World Championship gold medals. Following her retirement, Patria became team leader at three Commonwealth Youth Games, deputy chef de mission at the Gold Coast Games in 2018, and was appointed Australia's first female chef de mission for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games in 2022. Patria is currently Sport Integrity Australia's Acting Director of Sports Partnerships. Ben Hardy competed at the 2000 Olympic Games in the sport of volleyball. He was captain of the Australian national team and was a member of the team that won gold at the 2007 Asian Men's Volleyball Championships. He ended his professional sporting career in 2011 and like Patria, Ben continues to give back to sport, working with Sport Integrity Australia as a senior intelligence analyst. Well, firstly, to you, Patria, you retired after the Athens Olympic Games, where you won three Olympic gold medals in 2004. Uh, did you know at that time what was next and after sport? Yeah, look, I'd, I tried to be diligent during my swimming career and um, prepare for life after sport as best I could. And so I'd completed a degree um, in sports management and had a little bit of work experience, but you know, obviously taking the the giant leap of retiring from your sporting competition is is a big step, and it leaves a big hole in your life for, you know, a period of time until you you find something else um, that's challenging and rewarding to do. How long did it take you to to fill that hole? Um, I was quite fortunate in that, um, given the success I'd had in my career, I was able to do a bit of public speaking and presentations and things like that for uh, probably. 12 to 18 months, I think, I I sort of managed to, you know, make enough money to to live and and things doing that. Um, But then that sort of started drying up and it's probably not my comfort zone thing to do either. Um, So I really, uh, you know, started looking for a job and um, it was actually quite difficult for a a fair period of time to find find some work. 
What about the highs and lows of professional sport and those incredible highs that you experienced in 2004 at the Athens Olympic Games? Very hard to replicate that, I would imagine, outside the sporting arena. Yeah, there's there's few things that come close, to be honest. I think, you know, probably getting married and, you know, having kids are probably the, the two things that I can describe that would come closest to that sort of feeling of euphoria and happiness and, you know, in some in some stages relief as well. So, yeah, it is, it is different. Um, I think, uh, you know, it does certainly take a period of adjustment um, to, to settle into to normal life where there's not those huge highs, um, if you're lucky to get them during your sporting career. So, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy and uh, some people um, struggle with it. I think, you know, there's been plenty of stories around. Uh, certainly some of my swimming colleagues and friends have, have really struggled with the adjustment, I think, to, to living a regular person's life. We'll look at that next stage in just a moment with you, Petra, but uh, we've also been joined by Ben Hardy, the former Australian volleyball captain, and uh, Ben played at two Olympics, four world championships, but as I say, uh, he was captain of the Australian team, 420 games for Australia, but he retired from professional volleyball as a full-time player in 2011. Ben, how hard was it for you to step away from being a player into regular life? It certainly has some big challenges. Um, I think when you have such a long career, I mean, my career went 16 years or 17 years, um, and then you're changing that you've essentially stopped cold turkey it has some big challenges um i remember similar to or well, in some ways to to patria but i i um decided i was going to finish because of family reasons i still had the opportunity to keep playing and being overseas and, and playing professionally um when i came home i started university, my university degree and i didn't do that while i was playing because i i didn't want that um distraction as a as a an athlete and that was really difficult i mean it wasn't the fact of actually doing university and and doing the degree itself it was things like um the refinement and accepting that things aren't quite as perfect as they should be because you've spent your entire career trying to refine things and make them perfect and that that was really difficult in uh in a schooling sense i guess because everything you're trying to complete you go oh i'm not quite happy with that i want to do a bit more or i'm not quite happy that with that i want to do a bit more and that was the hardest part for me was was getting that uh, that balance life balance to life right what about filling the void um of the life of a professional sports person where you do have in incredible highs has, has it been hard to to replicate that it, it does it, it is like um i remember when i first came back to to canberra um and I, I essentially went cold turkey for four months. I didn't do any physical activity. You, you haven't got the program that you know you're doing your schedule, which is laid out for you. It's it's essentially on you. And I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to do that stuff because that was all part of what I had to do to 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 play volleyball. Um, but I came into the the ACT team after doing nothing, and I, and I I realised that actually this was almost a release for me to to go back into the state team and and do something I knew very well how to do, and I could relax doing it. You know, um, so for me, it was great to have a season of, of casual volleyball, let's just say, put it that way, or more relaxed volleyball, uh, and and get that, uh, I guess, softer, you know, um, relief out of the out of playing rather than the hard landing of, of going cold turkey. What about employment? Was it hard to, to enter the workforce after being away from it for a while? It was. It's two phase, you know, like um, when you're playing in a high level sport, you've got a lot of things that are taken care of for you. So I, I didn't have to worry about paying for my accommodation. You know, you get a good salary, all those sorts of things. Um, a bit more of a, a casual lifestyle where you're going out and you're going to dinner and, you, and you, you're a bit more affluent with your, your spending. And then you come home and that's all taken away from you. But the spending and so on is still there. I mean, you see a lot of athletes, I think, uh, getting into trouble when they finish because they've got used to this lifestyle, which you can't maintain because you don't have the income anymore so that's the one of the the biggest biggest things um and then trying to i guess recognizing that you haven't got a lot of these skills that other people have been doing for, for 15 or 20 years in the workforce and you have to start from a relatively low bar um i, I guess for me that was okay I'm, I'm comfortable to, to do that um recognizing that my ex experience in some ways is very com comparable in other ways it's not so you just have to you know get back from the top of the rung of the, the ladder and start your way not at the bottom per se but uh, you've got to put the work in again to to, to learn new skills
We'll come back to you in just a moment, Ben. But uh, Patria, how did you turn things around, g- given that you said you found it very hard to get back into the workforce? Yeah, look, it was hard. I just, I suppose, I just put, kept putting my hand up uh, for opportunities when they, when I saw them, and I missed out on a few jobs. And uh, but I eventually got an opportunity to do some uh, part-time or casual work at the Australian Sports Commission. Um, and, and so I did that for a while and then I had um, my first child and, and was out of the workforce again a little bit with that. And, um, but thankfully, um, you know, they, they took me back and I was able to eventually um, get win a full-time role um, at the Sports Commission and that's where my sort of, uh, I suppose, post-sport professional career started. Um, you know, but, you know, as, as Ben mentioned, you know, you spend... I, I was 10 years behind everyone else and Ben was even further behind with the amount of time, you know, that you devote to your sport. So it, it can sometimes be quite hard, um, you know, even though you've got a, a wealth of experience in the sporting world, um, you know, it might not necessarily be the, the experience that people are looking for or et cetera. So it's, it's really hard. you just got to keep trying and, and looking for those opportunities and taking them when they come up. A natural progression might have been to, to go back to the pool and be a coach, but you had no desire to to spend more time at the swimming pool, having spent most of your life there already. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there, there definitely wasn't any desire to be a coach. So, I mean, as you mentioned, like one of the reasons why I, I wanted to retire was because I was sick of the routine and, and getting up at, you know, quarter to five in the morning, um, six days a week. So it's, uh, yeah, I was ready to move away from it. But, you know, I always knew that I, I loved sport and I still love sport. Um, so to... I was really interested and keen to, to get a role in sport somewhere and um, I've probably taken, uh, you know, a different route in terms of becoming an administrator rather than a coach or et cetera. But, um, you know, I really enjoy still being involved and still being able to contribute. What about mental health? Because uh, we have spoken to a number of people who've just retired and they're saying, you know, mentally they're struggling. And, and you mentioned a moment ago, you alluded to it um, about former athletes struggling is that a is that a major issue? Do you think for for former athletes? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, a very real issue. Um, you know, when you spend so much of your life devoted to one particular thing, um, and and it's really is the focus of everything you do in your life, and then that's gone all of a sudden. Um, it's a big hole to fill, and I think some people, you know, fill that hole better than others. And you know, as I mentioned, there's been some of my swimming colleagues over the years that haven't made the adjustment very well or they or they didn't prepare for life after their, um, you know, their swimming careers. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot more effort now that goes into, um, you know, um, uh, athletes preparing for their life after sport. So there's a whole network of support staff um, through uh, you know, a lot of the Olympic and Paralympic sports now with athlete wellbeing and engagement that help them actually put some of those plans in place and, and take those steps to help prepare themselves for life after sport. All right. We'll come back in a moment uh, and I guess we'll, we'll get some advice from you on uh, from you on current athletes and how they can better pr- prepare for, for life after sport. But Ben, um, you mentioned there that it was just hard to get back going again. How, how did you motivate yourself apart from having that soft landing with the ACT volleyball side? How, how did you get back into it, given you were so far behind everybody else, as you mentioned? Well, I guess the first thing is I realised that I wanted to get an education and I wanted to go back to to, to university to, to do that, something I hadn't done when I was um, when I was playing. And that, I guess, gave me the first step stepping stone is to give myself some direction about what I wanted to do. Um, it's it's not an easy thing when you've you know you've got all the choices you're your own pretty much um, coming from a situation where it's all very prescriptive. So mm-hmm. I, I guess I had some help from the local um, sporting you know scene as well. Um, I got an opportunity with with volleyball ACT, which gave me a little bit of a grounding in there and some opportunities. And then from there, I guess putting the work in um, at university gave me opportunities to get properly into the workforce. It's it's not easy. I would I would put down to having a, a good support base around you as well, um, and having that motivation to 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 help you. Like because there are people there who love and support you. That is really important. I think when you've got people who don't really have that structure around them, and and people that that don't 
uh, really have the opportunity to bounce off ideas and have those discussions and um, and talk about the issues that that it really is hard for athletes when they get thrown from a, a very spotlight environment to an environment which six months down the track, yeah, you no one really wants to talk to you anymore because you're not relevant, um, and then you end up not being you know on the front pages anymore. Uh, it, it can be quite challenging. So you need a, a good support crew around you and away from the structure too that sport provides. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the hardest thing. Some people might uh, need to start putting their own structure in place to help them. Um, not that I'm sitting here as a, as a psychologist <laughs> or uh, um, in that sort of space, but it is certainly an area where having done sport for a long period of time uh, and athletes who, in my case, was voluntary. I, I decided to finish when I finished, um, whereas other athletes get injured and that's, that their career is cut short. So it's a completely different animal when you've got you want this whole career in front of you you're getting success and then because of injury you have to stop so there are different reasons that people people finish their careers and I think I was a pretty lucky one and mental health as we've mentioned with Patria it is a major issue for, for people stepping away from the spotlight yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, as, as I talked about beforehand, you have you have the fame, you have people wanting to know what's happening. You have uh, the means to to I guess have that that lucrative sort of lifestyle, and um, and then once that once that's all taken away from you, uh, it can have a big detriment to to your mental health. And you know that's a normal thing that you know of what's happening, but if you've got that um, that support base around you, I think it can really really help. Patria, do you think there there is enough being done? You, I know you've alluded to it with um, a number of programs, but I would imagine that an athlete in a bubble um, isn't really thinking outside the bubble in terms of life after sport because they're so in the zone. How do you break through that and is enough being done to, to help sports people at the moment? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, you, you, you definitely do get in a bubble and you're very laser focused on what you need to do and what you want to achieve. Um, but I think also one of the lessons that I learned along the way is that it's also good to have other things in your life so that when you have a bad training session or a bad competition, it's not the end of the world. You know, you've got other things to think about and work on and progress. So that was one of the reasons why I was really, um, you know, I suppose it wanted to do my studies while I was swimming as well. Um, and it took me almost 10 years to get my degree. But to be honest, it was one of the proudest moments of my life um, that I was able to stick stick through it and get it done. Um, and I was able to graduate from my course, uh, I think it was not long before the Athens 2004 Games. So it was sort of a nice uh, wrap up for me to, to get those two things done and you know, finish my career and also get my degree. Um, but in terms of the current athletes, I think they are pretty well supported in uh, I'm not saying all sports, but certainly the the well-funded high-performance sports, there is a lot of support around them with that um, athlete wellbeing engagement uh, managers in the sports and um, there is a lot of direction provided and, and programs that they can do, et cetera. So, but, you know, I think, you know, there can be all that stuff in place and mm. people, unless you are willing to um, engage with that as an athlete, it's all pointless. So it really comes back to the... Responsibility of the athletes, I think, also to start thinking about those things and start doing that preparation work so that when they do finish their careers and hopefully, as Ben was saying, it, it, they can finish on their own term, um, but so that when they do, um, whether, when they are ready to, you know, hang up the shoes or whatever it might be, um, that they have something else to move on to. Do people seek out your advice, uh, athletes that are about to retire or given you you have significant roles in Australian sport, including the chef de mission of the Australian Commonwealth Games team for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Do you find that people are asking your advice about, you know, what is life like on the other side and, and how do I prepare for it? Uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes they'll, they'll ask yeah. me or, or, or when, when do you know when it's the right time to retire? And yeah. I said, you know, I always just say, you'll just know, you know, you know, when you get to that stage when you've, you've put everything you can into something um, and it's time, whether it be through, you know, your body failing or you just had enough. Um, mm. And I was fortunate enough that I could go out on my own terms, similar to, to Ben, um, in that, you know, 2004 was always going to be my final event. So um, regardless of the result. But, yeah, certainly, you know, when anyone asks, I'm more than willing to chat to them around, um, you know, my experiences, um, the things that I learned along the way. And But, you know, everyone's got to go on their own journey and um, they, they've got to take responsibility for their own path as well. And, Ben, um, do you think enough is being done? 
the sports people these days to prepare them for, for life after sport? Well, I know it certainly has been a focus, um, particularly from the Sports Commission and, and AIS perspective, um, has been a focus of, of people's careers outside of um, of sport and it is something they're, they're quite proactive at it's quite difficult sometimes to get sports people to think about uh, the secondary you know the future in 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 their life because a lot of cases we're talking about young individuals who are like uh, to coin patria's laser focused on you know on what they want to do and they don't want all these other distractions so it's it's not an easy balance to get when you have um athletes that are trying to achieve and be the best that they can be uh and and then you've got this other focus on the side you know that but there is enough downtime in most sport to to um to be able to do these sorts of things i mean i know from my perspective i wasn't as planned as, as Patria was in, in her life. Um, I really just wanted to be the best that I could be and that was what I wanted to do. So it, it, it's down to the individual to to help themselves a little bit, but there are mechanisms in place now where they can reach out. They just have to be, um, I guess, cognizant enough to know that, yeah, I have that ability to be able to do that and be courageous enough to say, you know, this, I need a little bit of help here and these are the mechanisms I can, I can go to to try and reach out to get some of that help. You have uh, still been involved in volleyball as a, as a coach. Do you find that people are asking you in a mentor role, um, life after professional sport, if I step away from, from volleyball now, what is life going to be like? Yeah, I, I do. And I find I have more conversations with the younger athletes rather than the, the older athletes um, because they're not quite there yet. And mm. I would always tell them, you know, you, your sporting career is maybe 10 years long, in mm. some cases less, some cases more. But if, if you've got this uh, education behind you, that can benefit you for, for, for your life. So it's not something I did, but it's certainly something I would champion is, is trying to get all these young athletes to go through the schooling system, allowing themselves the time uh, to go and get themselves educated so they can get back into the workforce a little bit easier. Good on you, Ben. Thanks very much for joining us on Onside today. Uh, and thanks to you, Patria, as well. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening to Onside. We'll be back with another episode shortly. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au or check out our Clean Sport app.